worship. Would you sing with us? Then, Lord, my God, when I in awesome wonder consider all the worlds thy hands have made, I see the stars, I hear the rolling thunder, thy great God. Amen? Happy Father's Day. (laughs) Happy Father's Day. You look good. You look good, but some of me, I think you just, you you spent all your energy trying to get, look good and show up, didn't you? Well, you got to shake yourselves. Come on. This is called corporate worship for a reason. This isn't, uh, Pastor Ken's not even here, okay? Let your hair down. If you've got some Pentecostal in you, we'd, we'd, be, we'd be happy to have that this morning, okay? Just shake yourselves real quick, everyone together. Go ahead, it'll feel good. Not you, Faye, you'll fa- fall, something will fall off. <laughs> well, thank you so much, especially to the fathers. It's a wonderful day, wonderful day to celebrate God's grace in the form of our fathers. I'll tell you what, there's nothing, there's nothing in the world I've ever, ever been called any, any better than daddy. I love to be a daddy. And I know you do, too. And I know for those of you who are fortunate enough to have your fathers here this morning, tell them how much you love them. And if your kids are here, tell them how much you love them. And let's celebrate God's grace together, shall we? Would you stand? Father, thank you for this day. Thank you for your grace. 
in our lives. Thank you for our dads. Lord, and thank you for the example you've set for us. We love you, Lord. Be with us as we worship this morning. We love you. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Here's a song that we typically only sing at Christmas time, but I hate that because I love the song. Sing it with me. Emmanuel, Emmanuel, His name is called Emmanuel, God.
hear the joyful sound of our offering as your saints bow down as your people sing we will rise with you lifted on your wings and the world will see that yes the world will see yes the world will be seated. Isn't that good? You know, I got to thinking this week as we were, um, as I was preparing for this service, I don't think there's much that a dad can give their kids except a sense of safety, freedom from fear. The little guy I've been carrying around the last month, my back hurts, he's a big kid. And the first, uh, first week he was with us, man alive. He didn't want, anytime I walked away, he just cried, screamed. I put on Facebook, how long can a kid scream? I never did get an answer, but in his case, I found out it was about a week, about a week until he figured out, you know what, I'm safe here and I'll be all right. I was thinking about some friends of mine that in Indi Indiana, some of y'all are surprised I have friends anywhere. There's a couple in Indiana. And just about a year ago, they have kids that are my age, 18, 19, and 21, I think. One of them's married. 
One of them's married, and she put on Facebook, we adopted our kids today. And I sent her a private message. I said, are you serious? Is that, is that a joke? Is that looking back? She said, no. She said, we never adopted them until now, and they're all grown. And like I said, one of them's married, has a kid of her own. I said, why would you adopt them at this point in their lives? She said, you know what? We were, we were told not to try to adopt them because their family, it was a weird situation. They were afraid some family might crawl out from under a rock that they didn't want to know about. But they said that at this point, after they'd already been in their home over 15 years, those kids looked at them and said, you know what? We never felt like this was permanent until you've adopted us. They lived in fear. Even all those years they were there the entire time, they lived in fear that they were going to be taken away. And I couldn't help but all of us, we were lost. We were scared. But at that moment of repentance, we were adopted into his family. And we can live now no longer slaves to fear, but we're a child of God. Amen? That's exciting. That's exciting. I've never adopted a kid, but I've been told when you adopt a kid, and you look at that birth certificate, it's just like if you would have brought him into the world yourself. And I think that even though we were born into sin, we've been adopted into his family. And today we can live no longer slaves to fear. We're children of God. Amen? Declare that this morning as we sing. I'm no longer a slave to fear. I am a child of God. Well, I'm no longer a slave to fear. I am a child of God. You unravel me. You unravel me with a melody. You surround me with the song. Of deliverance from my enemies till all my fears are gone. And I'm no longer a slave to fear. I am a child of God. I'm no chosen me love has called my name I've been born again into your family your blood flows through my veins sing it out I'm no longer a slave to fear so I could walk right through it. You split the sea so I could walk right through it. My fears were drowned in perfect love. You rescued me so I can stand and sing. I am a child of God. You split
Would you stand as we sing that chorus? Well, I'm no longer a slave to fear. I am a child of God. I'm no longer a slave to fear. I am a child of God. One more time. Yes, I'm no longer. It's that love that casts out that fear, knowing that he loves us, knowing that you're a child of his. Look around the room. Brothers and sisters, not grandparents, we're all children of God. He loves us. 
He loves you. And he loves you. He loves each one of us. This morning, you can take your bulletin. And you can see some people that might need a special extra love this morning. People that have been going through a difficult time, whether that be through surgeries recently, whether that be through difficulties they faced at home or at work. Special touch this morning to Jesse and the family as we continue to lift them up in prayer over these days. Children's camp coming up this week. Things to be praying about. Things that God wants to do. The praise team is going to sing for us one more time this song. And as they do that, as always, the altars are open for you to come express your love to him this morning. Yes, he loves us. Oh, how he loves us. Oh. morning we need that reminder you love us you love me sometimes the world's a dark place sometimes we face difficulties and we get into those times where we begin to doubt why am I even here what am I doing why do I have the job that I have God, this morning, thank you for that reminder that you love us. When we go through those tough times, you're there by our side to walk alongside us, to carry us when we need to be carried. Lord, this morning, we ask that you would be with Pastor Ken and Linda as they're away for just a few days to spend some time with family. Give them a refreshing and a renewal that comes from you, that they would come back energized to continue to lead us and to guide us and to direct us to follow the path that you have. Lord, for those on our prayer list here, there seems sometimes like so many names. I ask right now that you would bring a name to mind, that we would circle that, that we would lift them up in prayer this week. These are our brothers and our sisters, our friends. Help us to be there for them in times of need. We ask right now, Lord, that you would come around Jesse and the kids, that you would surround them with your love, that during these days ahead, as they continue to deal with things in the loss of Pam, that they would do so in a remembrance that she's with you, that you love each one of them, that you would continue to support and put your arms of comfort and strength around them. Lord, this morning as we think about what you have for us here today, why you've brought us here, I don't believe it's on accident. I believe you have something for each one of us. I ask you would help us to put aside those distractions, those things that sometimes we focus on, what's going on later on the day or the week ahead, the summer plans, the vacations, the camp, and so many things that we get so wrapped up in that right now you just put that aside. May we listen to you this morning. You love us. May we hear that today in a new and a special way. Lord, this morning we ask that you would be with us in the things that we think the things that we say, and the things that we do will be pleasing in your name. We ask these things this morning in your name. Amen. Sing this with us before you sit down. Well, I'm no longer a slave to fear. I am a child of God. Yes, I'm no longer Before you sit down, turn to someone and say, 
I'm no longer a slave of fear. I'm a child of God. Say it. And then sit down. Well, good morning. I see some guys back there that are going to help us with our tithes and offerings. And as they come forward, let me remind you, today is Father's Day. And we do a couple things on Father's Day specifically. One, obviously, is take our normal morning tithes and offerings. But like I mentioned earlier, it is camp season. Some of you have been out camping as families, and that's great. But our children have an opportunity tomorrow. And then in a couple weeks from now, our teens will be at camp here on a Sunday, actually. It's over the w- a long weekend. It is not easy to go to camp financially. It costs quite a bit of money. But thanks to uh, the Gibson family, as they continue to help us support, they have uh, a scholarship that's available to help each one of our students go to camp. And it roughly takes, uh, for a teenager, it's $195. It takes about a third of that off for each one of our teens here from camp. And same thing for our children. It helps them out even more than that because it's a little bit less for them to go. And so thank you to the Gibson family for continuing to support and to work for that. In addition to that, today, any loose offering that goes in there that's not designated, not marked, if it's just a dollar bill or a hundred dollar bill, maybe a thousand dollar bill, I've never seen one. Uh, Maybe you'd like to help out in some special way. Or if you want to designate any extra loose change today goes to help transport our kids to camp. Tomorrow, there's 23 of them going. Now we have a 15-passenger van and 11-passenger van. Take the back seat out of the 15 to put in the luggage. That means 23 between the two, 12 and 11, if you can do your math there quickly with me. They're going to have to take another vehicle because you can't get luggage for 23 people in that back little space. So it costs a little bit more there. And our teens have 25 going to camp this year. We've got a big group going to camp, and we're excited about that. But we could use just a little extra help in making sure we get them all there safe and sound. This morning, thank you for your willingness to help out and to follow the plan that God has. Let's pray. Father God, this morning, we ask you would take these tithes and our offerings and use them for your intended purpose. We know that you have a plan and purpose for each cent that comes in here. Thank you for your love. In your name we pray. Amen.
Jesus in their dad. Want to love them like you've loved me, be the thing I can. Want to live a life that's holy, be a better man. Could have chosen anybody, I'm the one you gave them to. She's gonna be like me. There we go. Have you enjoyed the music this morning? I have. I've been touched. Sometimes I think, nothing against Pastor Ken, sometimes I think we could just go home right after our worship time because I feel God moves in such a way, and I don't know about you, I, I get into music a little bit. I enjoy doing it, especially when we get together with our teens and we go off to camp or some things like that where you can really maybe let loose a little bit more than we do on a normal Sunday morning and really worship in a different way. This morning, I can't help but look around, and I saw Paul look over at me. Yes, I sent him a memo on what to wear today, and he got it. The rest of you obviously missed that memo, but I looked over at him when he walked in, and he looked over at me a little later, and I saw him laugh. I knew what that laugh meant. I just, sorry, I got it, Paul. Well, y'all know that I tend to do things a little bit differently than Pastor Ken. And we're going to get started here this morning, but I'm going to need your help because I work with teenagers, and so I do things a little bit differently. I think everybody here either has a dad or has had a dad, so I need you all to stand for sure. And we're going to have a little bit of fun. I'm going to make sure I turn this thing on and move around. The things I'm going to ask you pertain specifically to your dad. Okay, these are specifically to your dad, whether he is here now or is not living. Um, think back to those times of when you remember your dad. It's called sit down if your daddy edition, all right? <laughs> so sit down if, if this pertains to you, sit down if your dad is bald or balding. You're going to learn a lot about the people you're sitting around with right now. Chris, yes, yeah, a little bit he is. All right, we'll give it there. We'll see. I have nine of these. We'll see if you make it to the end. This probably get a lot of them. Did your dad play golf? A few. All right, a few more. Sit down if your dad drinks coffee every morning. All right, there we go. Some of your dads learned that coffee stunts your growth. I see there's two back there. You all know me pretty good. Sit down if your dad has the same, has the same name as his father. Is he a, a junior? Okay, a few of you sit down. I, I, I promise you, I think by the last one, it will get everybody, but we'll, we'll see. Your dad a snore? <laughs> All right. Just a couple more. How about a dad with a birthday in June? No? Nope. All right. Did he ever coach one of your sports teams? Yes, Mackenzie, I, I coached one. You didn't like it. I stopped. Does your dad watch Sports Center every day? Or did he? Yes, Nate, I do. <laughs> You're right. This one, it's the last one. I, I, I'm pretty sure this gets everybody. If not, well, you can sit down afterwards because it's the last one. Probably everybody on that one. Has your dad ever embarrassed you? If my kids were standing, they would have been sitting, I'm sure, because we all have those dad things. We have our dad jokes. It's just something that you automatically get when you become a dad. Well, let me say happy Father's Day 
to all our fathers out there. In fact, I wonder by raising of hand, how many of you have had a father? Okay, all, obviously all of us would raise our hands to that question. And obviously equally as important to that, not all of us have had the same fathers and the same level of involvement of fathers in our lives as the persons right around us. Some have had fathers who were virtually non-existent for one reason or another. And then at the same time, ones have had fathers for what seems like they're there for every waking moment. The teenagers I deal with are probably sitting there going, yep, that's my dad. Some of you wives are elbowing, so like, yeah, you're, you're right there, and they invade your personal space too much. Today, I kind of want to talk to our fathers, but don't think you should have stayed home if you're not a father. I think it really pertains to all of us, what I have to share this morning. I wonder if there's anyone out there who would admit, don't raise your hand, I don't want to embarrass anybody, but you're a daddy's boy. Yeah, a few of you in the back there, I see a daddy's boy hand. Or maybe a daddy's girl, obviously. When I talk about being a daddy's boy today, I want you to think about it in a biblical term. When we see men in the Bible, it's not just referring to men most times, it's referring to all people. So when I say daddy's boy, it refers to all of us. I wonder if any of us were considered a daddy's boy growing up or a daddy's girl. Or maybe it was your sibling, it was your brother or your sister, and maybe you were a little jealous of them. Don't start sending text messages. I remember when you, you were dad's favorite, all those kind of things that we do. The reality of it is, is this is not a phrase that we've just heard today. It's a phrase that we've heard probably several times growing up. But I wonder how many of us have ever looked at it in such a way that you would consider God our Heavenly Father and you're his boy, you're daddy's boy. This morning I want to look at a few questions and want us to answer some specific things. And here's that question. When was the last time that you were completely and totally and utterly dependent on God for your survival? Do you only turn to him when you need something or do you depend on him for everything? Not some things but for everything. After answering these questions, I think we'll be able to understand a little bit more about how we are his boy, how we are daddy's boy. You see, you're not just a rescue mission. We sang about this this morning. You are a child of God. I heard that term recently, and it really struck me because I think my perception of being a child of God was a little tainted, to be totally honest. I look around the room, and yes, I have graying hair, but I'm still in my 40s, barely. I'm still there somewhere. I'm not going to tell you exactly that I'm 47. Um, but there's a few that are younger than me, and there's a few that are older than me. And I think the perception in our minds goes, well, yes, I'm a child of God, but someone who's older than me must be my grandparent, right? They're, they're a grandparent. They're not... They're not a sibling. And so I started looking at things in a little different light to say, Chris is a child of God. He's my brother. And Burl, his dad, is also a child of God. We're brothers in Christ. And it helped me see things a little bit differently and put them a different perspective in my life, at least, as I started thinking about everybody around me. We're all in this together. I don't have to look to just someone who is so much older and wiser to help me along, or maybe it's someone who's younger and wiser help me along we're in this battle together to help each other through sure sometimes we pick on each other because we're brothers and sisters but for the most part we're in this together several years ago i went out west with our family for vacation to spend some time with danielle's family they live in arizona and uh, not too far from california actually kingman arizona and we decided as a family that we were going to go to disneyland i don't know if you've ever been I had an opportunity growing up to go to Disney World, but had never been to Disneyland. Across the street is California Adventure. And if you're lucky, you buy a pass that gets you into both. Well, in our families, we have between us, our family and Danielle's brother and his wife, 
Danielle's sisters and mom and dad. We had 14 of us there. When you go to a big place like that, now th this is enough years ago that we didn't have the leashes that you carry your kids around on. Sometimes you've seen those. We didn't have those. We just thought we could get around just fine. So we decided we would have some fun, and, and, and some of you can relate this because y'all don't want to go to the same thing, right? Everybody in the, the whole group says, okay, let's go to the Tower of Terror. And you go, uh, uh, I think I'm fine just sitting right here because I'm terrified as it is. I don't need to go on the Tower of Terror to see that I'm terrified more. Uh, some of you are there for the, the fun, goofy characters. And by goofy, I really mean Goofy or Mickey or some of those different ones. But let's be honest, some kids sometimes are terrified even of those. And then there's those ones that they can't wait to see them and get there and give them a big hug and, you know, get love on them and, and all that kind of stuff. Well, my little nephew, Bronson was his name. He was about five or six at the time. And he could not wait to see Goofy. Goofy was his favorite. I thought he meant me because I tend to be goofy a lot of times, but he was referring to goofy with the long nose and all that fun stuff, and he couldn't wait. The problem was that we were so busy with everything going on and trying to figure out where we were going and what one we were doing and da-da-da that we didn't see Goofy walk by, and he was down the way, and Bronson took off. He ran over there. We didn't know. You start looking around for, where's Bronson? I thought he wanted to go on this ride too. I thought he was with you. And you begin to panic and you begin to wonder, and for the next 30 minutes, as we walked around trying to find Bronston, where was he? How could he get that far away? What did he do? Did somebody take him? And all those things that go through your mind as you begin to wonder what happened to Bronston. Now, the story could have turned out bad, but we did find him. We found Goofy, and there he was, right with Goofy by his side, holding onto his leg, basically. And they were trying to figure out where this little boy belonged and where he needed to go. It doesn't always turn out like that. I think we've probably all been to that place, whether it's an amusement park or whether it's the mall or whether it's your local Walmart shopping store, and you're walking around minding your own business, and all of a sudden across the way, you kind of hear it at first, but you start to look and you see that panic-stricken face of a little boy, scared to death. He can't find his mom and dad. And you start to hear him going, Dad! He's crying. And what do you do? Uh, they'll find him and you walk on your way, right? No, most of the time the parent instinct kicks in and you're like, oh my goodness, wh where's his mom and dad? And you go over them and you try to comfort them and try to, to, to come alongside them and, and help them out. And you start to look, where could his dad be? And then you find him. Whew, what a relief, Right? We've all probably been there or seen that. It can be a traumatizing experience for a young child to not know where dad is. I want you to picture something a little differently right now. In your mind, I'm going to take you to Africa. Aaron can go there a little easier because Tyler's been in Africa, so he's seen pictures. And if you haven't seen his Facebook, go watch the video of Tyler's experience on his trip this summer to Africa. But in West Africa... Thousands of children since the Ebola broke out in December of 2013 have died. But before they've died, a lot of times, it's usually their parents. And they leave these children by themselves, a mother, a father. All of a sudden, a child is alone. They're abandoned. Parents are dead. There's no one there to protect you. You're this child. I want you to picture yourself as that child. No one's there to protect you from the, the wild animals and the sicknesses that are taking place. You walk around and don't know really where to go. You find a house nearby and, well, there's maybe a little bit of food in there, but not much to really survive on. Another day passes, and you don't have any idea what you're going to do. You begin to panic a little bit. You're there by yourself, a child. You start to think that maybe it's, just the time that you're going to die too. And then off in the distance, you see a, a man standing there, and he says, I want to help you. Don't be afraid. You want to run, but you don't know whether to run to him or away from him. And then you start to see him slowly walk towards you. And he's got something to eat. 
and he shares it with you. You drink. He says, I I'm sorry about your mom, and I'm sorry about your dad. What a terrible thing. Let me, let me help you bury them. And as you help the man bury your parents, he starts to tell some of his story. He's been out traveling from village to village, trying to help any survivors that are left out there. Many parents have died and children left by themselves. In fact, while he was on his way to save you, his own son got sick and died. You begin to realize that this man, as he's telling his story, it's more than just a story. He loves you. He's trying to help you through the situation. It cost him his own son to save you. Hope begins to rise in you. Maybe there is life after this tragedy that I faced. You agree to go with the man, and over the coming weeks and months, you realize that he's not just an ordinary man. He's a very wealthy man. He owns several houses and farms, and over time, you start to realize that he didn't just save you from death. He's literally providing you with more than you could ever imagine. He takes you in as his own. You go on vacation with him, and he gives you gifts. And you feel more and more love. He saved you. And it cost his son's life in the process. I think John, 1 John actually 3, verse 1, expresses this kind of love. It says, See how much our Father loves us, for he calls us his children, and that is what we are. But the people who belong to this world don't recognize that we are God's children because they don't know him. You see, God sacrificed his own son for each of us, his children. It was that sacrifice that showed us a love that goes beyond anything that we can understand or even imagine, that selflessness and that sacrifice. He rescued us, sacrificed for us, forgave us. The thing is, he doesn't stop there. He chose to show us a love that goes beyond anything that we could ever imagine. He adopted us into his family. You aren't just a rescue mission. You're a child of God. I don't want you to overlook this because this is a huge thing. The God who created everything chose to adopt you as his own. He didn't have to do this. We don't deserve this. We deserve punishment, death, and even eternal separation from him. Ephesians chapter 2, verses 1 through 5 tells us this. It says, Once you were dead because of your disobedience and many sins. You used to live in sin just like the rest of the world, obeying the devil, the commander of the powers in the unseen world. He is a spirit at work in the hearts of those who refuse to obey God. All of us used to live that way, following the passionate desires and inclinations of our sinful nature. By our very nature, we are subject to God's anger, just like everyone else. But God is so rich in mercy, and he loved us so much, that even though we were dead because of our sins, he gave us life when he raised Christ from the dead. It is only by God's grace that you have been saved. I don't know about you, but sometimes I get the sense, and I definitely see this in teenagers as I work with them, you get a sense of entitlement. We think we deserve things because don't you know how hard my life has been? And we start to shake and we get the little thing going. We have a little bit of fun with life because we expect to be taken care of. If you are on social media at all, you probably see this because sometimes we use that as a place to divulge everything. Now, it doesn't have to be that way, but sometimes we do. I mean, think about this. Why would God do that? Haven't you seen their Facebook page? I posted about three times this week, and I even wore my Christian T-shirt. I should be the one getting all the blessings, not them. Sometimes I think those things go through our minds as we see the things on Facebook. We compare ourselves to those around us. Bob Goff, some of you have read his book, Love Does. He said this, comparing ourselves to each other is like asking God who's the greatest in heaven all over again. Did you get that? Comparing ourselves to each other is like asking God, who's the greatest in heaven all over again? Now, don't get me wrong. I use social media. I like social media to share some things. My parents, unfortunately, don't have Facebook. But if they did, 
they'd be able to follow along a little bit about things that are going on in my life, in the life of our teenagers, in my kids' life, and see some things. So there's some positive things that can be used. There's a message that can be shared. You can use it to guess what? Put a scripture verse on there. Who thought, right? And some of you do that, and I've seen that. And some of you have your own little verse thing that you share on a daily basis. But social media isn't always that way. Sometimes it's used for things that aren't great. However, I didn't start enjoy using social media until this simple truth. Most of us post our highlights. That's okay. I post a lot about my adventures, like I said. There's pictures of how great my kids are and my wife and your, your students, your teenagers. But what about that time that I lost my temper? Did I post about that? I let everybody else see whatever the, the true me. Social media, for the most part, is a highlight reel. Once you see it for what it is, you can start enjoying it a little more. We have to stop comparing ourselves and start enjoying how God chooses to bless people. No one has a perfect life, no matter how perfect their lives might appear on social media. Those are things that we have to use to filter what we see. I think a lot of times we look at the things that we see, whether it's sometimes on the news, whether it's on social media, whatever mead means that you use, you have to use a little bit of a filter. It's not always as perfect as what it looks like. All right, I'm on a little bit of a rant, and I need to probably move off the social media thing. Being a Christian isn't about what we can do for God. It's about what God did for us. Not what we can do, but about what he did for us. Our salvation comes through Christ. He came to this earth as a child. He grew up, and he paid that ultimate sacrifice for us. Death on a cross. Ephesians 1.5, it says this. This is what he wanted to do, and it gave him great pleasure. What he did was for you and for me. He came knowing he was going to die a death on a cross because he loves us. It's great news. He's not some God who's off in heaven looking for some way to, oh, you just messed up and flicks you on the back of the head. He's not a dictator over there just telling us everything. He is a loving father. In Matthew chapter 7, verse 11, it says, so if you sinful people know how to give good gifts to your children, how much more your heavenly Father gives good gifts to those who ask him. For some of you, when you think of God as a father, I know it makes your stomach turn a little bit. Heavenly fathers are different. Our heavenly father is. But earthly fathers, let's be honest, guys, we fail. And sometimes, for some, that failing has happened a lot. Some don't like to hear that God's our Father because of how terrible earthly fathers have treated us. I was fortunate myself to have a dad who I knew loved me, a dad who loved God, a dad who loved his wife, a dad who loved and continues to love his family. And I thank God for that. But not everyone has that. I really I have some good news, though, for those of you who have not experienced that love of a father. It says in Psalm 68, verse 4 and 5, that God is a father to the fatherless. It says, sing praise to God, to his name. Sing loud praises to him who rides the clouds. His name is the Lord. Rejoice in his presence. He's a father to the fatherless, defender of the widows. This is God whose dwelling is holy. I don't know if you've heard of a guy by the name of John Piper, but he talks a little bit about what it means to become a Christian and how that changes our world and the things around us and how we've been adopted into his family. And he has three points that he shares about this. Let me share with you this morning those points. He says, number one, children of God are led by the Spirit of God. In Romans 8, 14, it says, for all who are led by the Spirit of God are children of God. To be a child of God means that we're united with Him. Romans 12 talks about the fact, Paul shares, 
that our minds are transformed. They're being transformed, which means that as a child of God and we're united with him, we start caring about those things that God cares about. It's not about us. It's about him. The second point he shares, he says, children of God are lights in the world. We're different from the world. We shine God's light, his love, his character, his truth, who he is to a dark world around us. Philippians 2.15 says, Live clean, innocent lives as children of God, shining like bright lights in a world full of crooked and perverse people. That verse we looked at in 1 John 3.1, I think is what the second half of that verse was talking about, where the world doesn't know us. Our lives are so different now that Jesus has come in, it doesn't even make sense to the rest of the world. And let me just put a disclaimer on there, or at least it should be. Because when Christ comes in our lives, it should be different. We change. And from there, it's a place that we turn around and we walk the other way. It's 180. It's not a 360 where you just walk all the way around and keep doing what you used to do. It's a time to change your life and to be that light. Some of you have experienced this firsthand because in your family situations, maybe you're the first Christian that's been there. They need to see that light of God in your life and through your life. And the third thing John Piper says Children of God are heirs of all things. Romans 8, 16 and 17 says, For his spirit joins with our spirit to affirm that we are God's children. And since we are his children, we are his heirs. In fact, together with Christ, we are heirs of God's glory. But we are, if we are to share his glory, we also must share in his suffering. I don't know if you caught that in there, but it says that we are heirs with Christ question is, what are you an heir of? Like, what is he an heir of? And it says in Hebrews 1, 2, now in these final days, he has spoken to us through his son. God promised everything to the son as an inheritance, and through the son, he created the universe. Did you catch that one word in there? God promised everything to the son. So here it is. Christ is an heir to all things, which means then we are heir to all things. Have you thought about that? All things. Not some. Now, don't think you're just going to go to the store and like, oh, I want that TV, and we walk in and we grab that new big TV. That's not what it's talking about. But he's the heir of all things. It really should change the way we see things and maybe put them in perspective because everything that he has, we have. And so we need to stop focusing about the things in life, but instead what really matters. Heaven's real. Hell's hot. People need the gospel. People need God's love. Just over 22 years ago, Danielle and I became parents for the first time. After a long night, and then a long day, and then a long night, Drew finally entered the world. I think it's safe to say that without us there by his side every moment to help him survive, he wouldn't be here with us today. As children, as a child, he was dependent on us for everything. So I ask you those questions again in our relationship to him being our dad. When's the last time that you were completely and utterly dependent on God for your survival. Do you only turn to him when you need something? Or do you depend on him for everything? You're not just a rescue mission. You're a child of God. He wants to spend time with you daily. Every day. Depend on him. It's okay. He loves you. You're a child of God. Are you a daddy's boy? Let's pray. Father God, today we give you thanks for who you are. You're our dad. I know sometimes in a world where fathers have not lived up to what they should, that's sometimes hard for us to grasp and understand. I ask you would help us as we go from this place today that you would help us a little bit more understand 
the fact that you are our dad, that you love us, you're there to provide for us and to help us through those difficult times, to join with us in those times of greatness, that you love us and that you want what's best for us. Help us as we go from this place today to share that love with others. Don't keep it for ourselves, but with our friends and our families, that we would share that love with them. You love us and want to do great things in us and through us. In your name we pray this all. Amen. Would you stand with me as we sing? Well, I've heard a thousand stories of what they think you're like, but I've heard the tender whisper of love in the dead of night, and you tell me that you're pleased and that I'm never serve a father like that. Amen. Hey, let me tell you real quick about what's going on around here. First, you know, you know, God's crazy about you. 
Did you turn my mic off again? God's crazy about you. If God had a refrigerator, your picture would be on it. That's how much God loves you. We got stuff going on around here. This um, VBS is coming up. We've already talked about camp today. And one thing about summertime, we have, we have those iconic things that you remember from your childhood and I remember from my childhood. One's camp and one's VBS. And ours is coming up. And just like I've told you about camp over and over and over, lives are changed through camp. Lives are changed through VBS, okay? And um, VBS is kind of like a camp that happens here. And, and maybe some of the kids can't go to camp, but they can't come to VBS. It, the dates are July 10, 15 to 18. 15 to 18, every night from 6.30 till Friday. Kids are never going home from here. We're just, they're going to keep them all week. I can't wait. It's going to be a good, it's really, really, I'm not going to be here. I won't be here, but my kids will. But we need volunteers. We need volunteers. Some of you signed up on your commitment forms. We're, we're going to be getting in touch with you about that. But if you, if you didn't sign up on your commitment form and since then you've said, you know what, I should be a part of VBS, the answer is yes, you should. We have lots of room. We need some greeters, kitchen help, games, classroom assistants, and more. So there is a place for you. There's a spot in VBS that's your size, I promise. So talk to, talk to Robin or uh, April, April Ryan, and they will, they will hook you up with that. We have camp this week. You've already heard about that. So that means if your kid's not going to camp, there are no activities. Uh, unless you're Pastor Pete's, unless you're in Pastor Pete's group, everyone younger than that, there's no activities on Wednesday night, okay? So it's another good reason to go to camp because we got nothing for you on Wednesday night. And finally, tonight... Tonight we have a big cookout here from 5 to 8, Father's Day cookout, but everybody's invited. If you ever had a father, you're invited, okay? So that's most of you. Come at 5 o'clock, bring some meat to throw on the grill. They're going to be grilling. Grab a, a dish to pass and a two-liter of pop and bring, some, bring some, some lawn chairs, bring some games. It's going to be 75 degrees. We've already planned on that outside. It's going to be a great, maybe not, maybe bring your personal fan or whatever. You, but but, but come, come fellowship with the with, with the church. It's going, to be, it's going to be a wonderful time. Bring some discs. Play on the, on the disc golf course. Show us your skills. We plan on being here. Five to eight tonight. It's going to be a wonderful time. Thank you so much for choosing to be with us today. Go get your cup of coffee and go to Sunday school. Have a great day.